Hi everyone, um, welcome to a Novasco presented webinar where, we're, where we'll be talking about Cisco Firepower. My name is Rick Hagen from Novasco. Um, we're going to have a look today at some of the advanced features, um, some ideas around tuning, and then we're going to talk about some best practice as well. The idea is to give you a, a, some insight into what Firepower can do and some of the other ideas around how you can achieve that. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of features on a, a modern next generation firewall. So I've tried to pick some key selections and I hope uh, I hope that they're of use to you, of course. A uh, little bit of housekeeping at first. Uh, there are about 40 slides or so, so we'll be looking at approximately an hour. I uh, hope everyone has a, a cup of tea and maybe some biscuits to hand. Okay, right, so um, very, very quickly, don't wanna bore you with who we are, but we are Novasco, we're a Belfast-based company, although you might notice my, my accent is not from Belfast, I'm from Manchester. We are experts in delivering cloud solutions as well as managed services, managed WAN consultation. Uh, just a little list of some of the services that we are trusted to deliver to our customers. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Rick Hagen, I've been with Novasco for two years. I moved between two roles at Novasco really, a senior technical consultant and a technical pre-sales consultant as well. I've been in a mixture of pre-sales and technical for a while and I think the benefit of that is it helps you to not just see the, the glossy data sheet but also beyond that to the, the nuts and bolts of designing and implementing. I, th I really think that gives you a, a, another angle when you're, when you're thinking of these products. I've been a Cisco obsessive for a long time. Uh, as you'd expect uh, in, in the industry, you, you get to touch a lot of uh, other vendor products too. I've worked with firewalls from Checkpoint, Forcepoint, Fortinet, and even, even watch guards actually in my day. I, I come from a routing and switching background, but then branched into network, network security over the many years. So I was there at the start, you might say, um, I was there with uh, Cisco, uh, Cisco Pixies back in the day when you could you could look after a firewall with just the CLI. Um, I've seen products develop over that long periods, slowly creeping up the OSI model towards the application layer. Things have gone simple subnets to SDN virtual networks and micro segmentation. And the PIX itself has gone from ASA to ASA with IPS, ASA with CX, which I'm sure nobody remembers, and ASA with Firepower Services. Finally, where we are today, Firepower Threat Detection. So who do I think who do I think you are? Or that is to say, why do why do I hope that you're here and what do I hope you're expecting to see? I've tried to make this as interesting as possible and as useful as, as possible to, to a, as many different people as possible. Um, the idea is that you might be already an owner of a firepower and you're looking for features that you might not be using or trying to maximize your investment. Maybe you're not fully utilizing alerts or there's a lot of noise in the system and you're trying to, trying to reduce and refine. You might already own a, a, a firewall, an next generation firewall from another vendor and you're, it's a refreshing, a, a time to refresh, tech refresh, and you, you wanna see what uh, Firepower can offer you that maybe your current vendor uh, product can't. Um, I'll, I'll also be showing a little bit of the, of the different models that are currently available because I think, as we all know, it's a bit of a moving target and it's very good to see exactly what is, what's on the market, what's on the offering from Cisco. It's probably worth mentioning what I think makes a next generation firewall. Uh, and I would, I would sort of define it, what I think of it as, is the, is the ability to recognize extensively network protocols. So this is application visibility and control, and it's blocking based on applications. It's the ability to identify file types and, and identify files within traffic, within TCP streams. Um, it's to be able to provide contextual awareness. I think this is a really important factor, which is to be able to decide the potential impact of a, an attack on a host or um, how relevant it is to a specific OS. Um, it's also the ability to identify users and user activity. 
and finally I think it should incorporate some sort of shared threat intelligence which usually comes from cloud sources and this is how we uh, try to mitigate against malicious websites and botnets and um, sometimes I would also say that that includes uh, sandboxing to try and mitigate against zero day attacks. So this is the agenda, this is what we're hoping to get through uh, this morning. Uh, like I was saying a little bit about the, the models and the architecture. There's a, a new product out and um, there's deprecations of products as well that are, is always taking place so it's really important to see what it is that's actually available on the market right now. Uh, we'll take a, a quick look at the architecture, understanding what makes a firepower. We'll then have a bit of a feature overview of how firepower is meeting current detection demands with its features. We'll look at inspection, how it works, some advanced tuning, and how we can use the powerful correlation tools for CM, seam like alert creation. We'll look at a few simple best practices that you should be using, and finally, we'll look at some cross-platform integration and how this works for advanced remediation. Um, like I said, th this is not supposed to be a, a quick start guide or a 101. I've tried to pick some, some key interesting ideas, some things I've seen when I've been deploying or designing that I think maybe people don't, don't recognize they can do or, or maybe just need to near their hand getting, getting right. Um, okay, so as you might expect and as you probably already know, there's a number of Cisco Firepower models available. The, the original ASA with Firepower Services, uh, been around for a long time, it essentially was Firepower bolted onto the, onto the side of the ASA. <laughs> Phone going off. Um, so the ASA has actually now finally been given its end of service announcement, but the, a number of the models have been uneconomical to purchase for some time. Uh, so actually the Firepower 1000 is the new replacement for the ASA and, and there's a direct replacement for the 5506 which is your, your low end branch and that's the, that's the new 1010, FBR 1010 and they go all the way through to a, a full width cabinet 1140 and you can see the, see the IPS inspections there. The, the big difference between a Firepower 1000 and an ASA is that when you, they bolted the firepower services onto the side of the ASA, there was no hardware acceleration. Everything was done as a software module. And when you enabled all your IPS inspection or your uh, um, application visibility and control, this, this had a dramatic effect on reducing the, the throughput of the device. So the Firepower 1000 is, is, a, is a full FTD, no, um, no ASA software. It's the full FTD software and it has an MPU for acceleration. The, the next product, next product up, is the Firepower 2100, which, which I see most of out in the field, and um, that basically has the ability to have 10 gigabit interfaces and hardware modules, and it's, it's more of an enterprise product for use in, in medium to large enterprises. The Firepower 4100 is for large enterprises or small data centers, as you can see, runs up to 55 gigs of throughput. Um, it also has the ability to run multiple uh, firewall instances or FTD instances running on the same hardware, a bit like how uh, ASAs would use contexts. The 9300, obviously for large data centers, I'm not even sure whether I've been in the same room as one, um, these have separate interchangeable hardware security inspection modules that can run ASA, FTD, or even third-party software such as Radware. Um, and these are allowing for multiple instances, which is where they fit certain other deployments. All of the devices, all the way down to the uh, ASA with Firepower services, can run in an active standby. But the 4100 and the 9300 can also do a, a shared compute, which is how the 9300 can get up to um, a quite staggering one terabyte of throughput. There are understandably uh, virtual deployments and cloud deployments, and there's also a service module that you can install into an integrated services router, 
which you might have at your edge for integration into Cisco's DNA, which is that sort of SD, SD, SDN architecture for enterprises. Okay, so like I said, the uh, the 2100 series is, is the, the firepower that I see mostly in the field. Uh, they come in four flavors, which uh, is not just down to the, the throughput of the device, but actually there's some extra modularization and redundant PSUs in, in the larger boxes. The modules, network modules, they only come in two flavors, so it's a pretty simple choice. You have a one gig SFP or a 10 gig SFP plus, and these can come in a, a fail to wire version. So you can actually, if there was a hardware failure of either of the, either of the boxes, because you generally would have it in a cluster, you can actually fail to the wire for an inline interface. Firepower is made up of two components, two operating system components called the FXOS and also the software, the security software that runs on top of the FXOS. For the 2100 series, this is actually merged into one sort of merged operating system where the FXOS is a read-only read -only module, really, read-only software component that runs within the system just for the purpose of interacting with the chassis interfaces and to do hardware troubleshooting and, and for sort of uh, troubleshooting along those sort of lines. This is, this is why the 2100 series doesn't yet do multiple instances because it doesn't have that FXOS to act as a hypervisor as, as you see on the 4100 and 9300. So we've got our firepower. Um, what are, the, what are the, the current methods that we can use to manage it? I'm sure most people on a firepower will manage them with the virtual, the virtual FMC, the Firepower Management Center. You can get appliances, uh, physical appliances for the FMC, but I'm not going to, I haven't seen them around, I'm not going to talk about them. So I would consider the FMC, a virtual FMC, to be the preferred management option. Um, it's fully featured, you can do everything from it. Uh, all the features that you see in the, in the software and the release notes, the FMC, is your, is your go-to to to enable those features. Um, for the 2100 series and the 1000 series, you can also use the Onbox Firepower Defense Manager. Um, this historically has had all the features of the F hasn't sorry had, had all the features of the SM FMC, but it is catching up. Um, but for me, when you think about it, if if you if you spend all the investment if you can't do all the things you bought your firewall for, then it doesn't make sense that you would use the FDM, the Firepower Defense Manager, because Cisco have made actually the, the FMC so attractive with its price point that actually you would just use the FMC without really thinking. Um, the final option, which is a new option, is the is the cloud-based defense orchestrator. This this is it's it's got quite a lot of features, but I would say it's not quite there yet. You can do uh, management of all sorts of uh, different Cisco security products, Umbrella, Firepower, of course, ASA, and I'll bring that all in and actually merge your security policies between the two. You can even do a migration from an ASA to a Firepower within the system, within the actual orchestrator system as part of that. But again, a little bit like the FDM, it's not quite there yet. It doesn't have all the features. I'm, I'm thinking a year, a year and a half from now, will all be wanting to use the, the defense orchestrator as the as the preferred management. Okay, so much like an ASA and with many other firewalls, there are a number of ways you can deploy firepower. The options are sort of split between fundamental deployment types, either being rooted or transparent, or super, some people call it a bump in the wire, don't they, for, uh, for transparent. Um, I have only opted for rooted deployments, as, as you can get all the features you need, in, in my opinion, and, and get around the issues of, of not having a firepower switched interface by, by just by, by using switches, which I think is a, a, cheaper, a cheaper option because you get the flexibility of having a rooted firepower, but you still can have your switched interfaces as well um, on another device. Aside from the obvious rooted interface, you can have three main interface types. And uh, they are inline, which uses 
a sort of bit like a bump in the wire uses a pair of uh, VLAN interfaces that pass through the device for through the appliance and um, traffic is passed up to the snort engine and it's blocked if it's needed. There's uh, inline tap which is very much the same as the as the layer two pair for inline but passes a copy of the information to snort which can then which can then alert on its findings but you cannot actually drop the packets it, it's it's literally a copy of the packets or a copy of the stream um, and then only for inspection um, and the, the final interface type that you can have which comes in ER span or just a standard inter, um, uh, passive interface um, allows for the the traffic to be inspected again it terminates terminates the traffic onto the interface but you you can't you can't actually drop it because there's no way of interacting with the traffic okay so in summary of the sort of the deployment um, what I see as a standard firepower deployment and this is this is what I see in 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 all my customers and this is what I see when I is how I design or my baseline for design for a customer is uh, an on-prem FMC, a virtual FMC, uh, a cluster or sorry, an active standby of Firepower 2100s, uh, normally deployed deployed at the at the internet edge, and with a mixture in routed mode, but with a mixture of uh, routed and inline or tap interfaces as as are you know, as are needed for the design. Um, okay, right, so. I would say that's just I didn't want to spend too long just talking about the the, the models and things like that uh, because I think it's more important to have a look at the features right now. But uh, I think that covers a bit of an architecture, puts it all a bit in perspective. The the Firepower One Thousands are are a new new model. Um, the the end of uh, end of service for the Fifty Five Hundreds, the ASAs, is actually a new event. So so maybe some maybe some information that you weren't already aware of. Um, okay, so. So next, I'm going to talk about how the firepower is trying to meet threat threat mitigation. Uh, there's no shortage of statistics and elaborate diagrams. Um, I'm not going to put those sort of standard statistics on the on this presentation because I find them a bit you know a bit overused. Um, so it, it's up to the vendors of of security products to, to meet the demands of. Of, of mitigation, and it's up to us as as security professionals to utilise the products uh, to the, to the best of the product's abilities. Uh, and and the only way to do that is for us to really fully understand what a, what a product can do. Um, as mentioned in the in the standard deployment, the firepower I expect is going to be at the internet edge. And even with the sort of migration to many services you know, in cloud platforms, locally hosted services, including web services, are still really common. So from attacks like drive-by attacks, SQL injections, and cross-site scripting, protection and mitigation of, of these sort of attacks is, is actually still really important today for, for an enterprise one edge. Uh, it's up to us to try and maintain patching and to try and avoid uh, software vulnerabilities, OS vulnerabilities as well, but but we're still going to have problems from malicious internal activity, from malicious sites, and from continued malware proliferation. Um, so this is a rundown of, of the of the key features that I would say are, are how the, the firepower would mitigate threats or attempts to mitigate threats. Um, it's a, it's a next generation firewall, so you, you can see on the list there, there's some things that are in common with other next generation firewalls, but I would say that there are key differentiators that, um, that I would hope to get across this morning that, that make the firepower different from, from other next generation firewalls. I think, I think one of the things that immediately stands out and one of the, sort of the, the design uh, fundamentals for firepower is about using open standards as much as possible for a maximum integration with other systems and therefore a maximum um, threat detection and mitigation effect. The, the open standard Snort engine, for example, allows you to install signatures from multiple different non-Cisco sources if needed. Uh, open app ID, used for application visibility and control, currently detects something like 4,000 applications and, and that is in part because of its open standards nature. 
Cisco also are, is very proud of its Talos machine learning assisted sort of threat detection intelligence center. I'm sure you've, you've heard of that. Um, this is used in the intelligent feeds for DNS, URL, and IP based protection. As of 6.3, uh, all crypto processing is accelerated in, in hardware in the NPU. So um, you can actually now de decrypt not at the at the same sort of levels of um, throughput degradation as you used to be able to or on, on some other appliances, some other next generation firewalls. Uh, there are sort of UTM features that you'd expect from a next generation firewall, such as URL filtering. You can use um, network and host profiling to baseline normal behavior, which I think is a feature that is, is uncommon in, in, the set, in, in the next generation firewall features. Um, so you can, you can take these baselines for normal behavior for a host and, and set uh, applications for, for an SQL server. So you, you could say if there was a sudden increase in traffic from a host or an application that's used on a, on a certain host, you can then define how we generate responses for that. Um, I think this sort of fits with the, the correlation policies that I'll talk about later. Um, as well as Talos, Cisco's Talos, you can you can utilize shared intelligence feeds from many other sources, Open Vault, and just lots of them. There's there's, there's lists out there, um, and you can integrate these into your policies to have uh, blacklists to to stop access to malicious sites and and to block botnets and so on and so forth. Um, so, in summary, yeah, what I th what I think sums up a firepower is is the ex extent of the configurability, but also how you can you can you can utilize uh, these open standards approaches that bring in information from lots of different sources and that allows you to to to, to alert and to 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 have um, a response to to a complex and changing requirement okay so if you take all those sort of features and you, you distill them down into into policies um, it sort of boils down to um, Sort of the threat and the traffic analysis policy policies that um, we'll use to leverage on the firepower. Um, most of these are understandably done through the access control policy, which acts as a sort of policy core linking linking back into other policies such as DNS, identity, SSL, and pre-filter. Uh, there's some extras that you'll see are sort of missing on there, which is sort of maybe NAT and VPN and QoS and routing maybe. Um, but I, was, I sort of see those as more uh, sort of functional functional controls, and and the firepower is very very capable of using these. Um, okay, so um, so that's a little bit about sort of what the firepower is doing to try and meet the the, the sort of the threat detection requirements of today. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about understanding traffic inspection, and, and then we're going to have a little look as well at, at some tuning. Um, how we can affect the alerting and, and stuff like that. Okay, um, I, I think when we're thinking of sort of utilizing the inspection and the advanced tuning and, and, and the venting, we're sort of what we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of the noise. I, I mean, we're trying to reduce down the false positives, and we're trying to make it so that the alerts that are coming out of the system. Are actually the ones that we want to be acting on rather than and just ignoring. And there's, you know, there's again, there's lots of statistics out there to say 40% you know, of alerts aren't, aren't being uh, are being received, aren't being acted on. And 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 I've been in, in in the field for so long, I can I can totally see that you, people receive too much, too much information. There's nothing you can act on. You've got your, you've got your day job sort of thing. We need to make sure that what we're doing is generating intrusion events for for actual activities that, that are real, that are that have an effect on our infrastructure. So I think the first thing you need to do prior to uh, prior to, to tweaking or uh, getting involved in any sort of tuning is, is understand how a firepower actually deals with traffic inspection. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of a lot of uh, diagrams out there on, on the internet, but it depends which sort of aspects you want to look at. I would say this is this is probably the most useful way of looking at 
how uh, a packet is, is dealt with on the system. And this is so this is actually not uh, um, how a packet is processed, but it's actually the the order of operation. So it's not sort of a, an exact representation of the flow through the processes, but more how the, how it bounces between the policies and the order in which it does that. Um, so the first policy is the pre-filter, uh, which you can think of as, as a sort, of the sort of ASA part of firepower, the sort of the old school, um, only looking at layers two to four being Ethernet frames, IP addresses, TCP, UDP, uh, sequencing and, and, and ports. Um, you should be definitely using the pre-filter um, in your overall policy design, which I'll look at again later. Okay, uh, next, prior to running the access control policy, the, the firepower identifies the applications that are actually in the TCP stream. So it reassembles the packets and then works out what the applications are. And, and to do that, it runs a sort of pre-IPS containing uh, the open app ID signature, the 4,000 open app ID signatures I mentioned earlier. Um, once it's identified those signatures, then we move on to decide which of our access control policies you're going to pick. Obviously, you can have more than one access control policy, not just for different, um, not just for different devices, but within um, within the same device and inheritance and that sort of thing. So we pick our access control policy, and then that dictates what security intelligence, what identity, what SSL policies we're going to be using because they're sort of bound, as I was mentioning earlier, bound in a core to the access control policy. So we picked our access control policy. And now we go into the into the sort of security intelligent feeds, intelligence feeds, I should say. So this is this is IP blacklist. This is URL blacklist. This is the DNS feeds. This is this is the information coming from Talos or from your your other sources of your choosing. And these are blacklists yeah, organized into groups that you can define into your policy. And I think a lot of people are using them. Maybe not using. Um, alternative sources, but a lot of people are using them, and then th they're very, very effective. And, and I would, I would certainly recommend um, use, using them and and using um, using sources if you're choosing, and just investigating the ones you want to use. So once we've done the, the security intelligence, it moves on to the identity policy. Uh, slightly, slightly confusing, I think. But but what the identity policy is doing is defining traffic and then defining how you want to define the users within that traffic. So that might be something like uh, either an active uh, identification of, of those users. That could be a captive portal served up on, on the FMC itself, or that could be passive, which is um, handing off authentication uh, to AD integration. So you may be using a, an AD agent installed on, on Active Directory and binding the user and the, and the authenticated authentication into AD into a, into a user IP binding within the FMC. Once we've uh, decided to or decided not to uh, identify users within the within the the traffic, then we move on to the SSL policy, which, as it as it sounds like, is is the options to decrypt or make exceptions uh, to decrypt uh, based on on the traffic flow of your choosing. And it's only now that you get to the actual access control rules. So this is the the layer three to the layer seven from the networking all the way up to the application, and and this is where we define um, based, you know, based on the rule sets. This is where we define our to or from ports, networks, applications, all that sort of stuff, and then say what we want to do with the traffic. Um, and, and I'm sure anybody who owns the box is quite aware of the, you know, the, the options around there. So the allow and, and the trust being the sort of the, you know, our trust of blocking should say being the, the, the three key ones. Um, generally, I don't use monitor, but I allow at this point would send traffic to the next step, which is the SSL policy, sorry, the intrusion policy. Um, and trust would then say, no, don't don't inspect it any further and send it straight through out to the egress. So once we've had the, uh, the access control rules, then we hit the intrusion policy, which is our snort rules, which we'll, we'll talk a, a, quite a bit about uh, later. Uh, and then finally, we've got the, the malware and the file inspection, which I'm sure, as you've seen, is, is sits on a sits on another sort of rule policy base. Um, okay, so um, I think without really understanding this flow, 
you, what, what you have is, is, is a lot of different policies and they, they sit in a sort of abstract, disconnected way and you don't know where you should be sticking, or possibly don't know, I should say, where you should be sticking an access control because what's the most efficient way, what's the most effective way, and, and what, I'm, what, I, what the plan should be is to try and bring these together into, a, into a logical order, into, a, into an order of operation. So we, we, we inspect or drop or allow traffic based, based on the type of traffic that it is. Okay, so uh, a little bit um, now about the base policy. This is just something I've seen around, and I don't, I don't think it's totally clear. When, when you're choosing your base policy, you can choose between a number of uh, predefined base policies, your, your balanced security and connectivity, and your connectivity on security, so on and so forth. As you'll, as you'll know if you own a firepower, this enables or, dis, or disables intrusion rules or snort rules in, in your policy, in your base policy. Um, it makes sense that more more security, as in security over connectivity, means more rules. I think I think that's sort of obvious, but it's not so obvious. I think what that actually means. Um, and it's based on the common vulnerability scoring system. Is that right? Uh, the CVSS, uh, and that's based on the a and or it's based on the age of the rules and also uh, the categories that those rules are in. So. Um, it's sort of taking that obscurity out of it. Uh, I'm not going to go into the differences entirely, but but it's just to give you an idea. And, and at the bottom of the slide is a little link there that will take you to a slightly less concise Cisco uh, explanation, but with a bit more detail. Um, so once you know, once we've got a right base, really, then I wanted to talk about something a bit different, which is the the network discovery, which is something that's enabled out of the box. It's, you you can't avoid it. It's it's going to be happening no matter what. But it does need a little bit of uh, a little bit of tuning, in my opinion. Um, so I see most people doing this, um, and the information is certainly out there. But it's worth mentioning, uh, I think, in in relation to um, into uh, into the previous slide. Um, so. Um, what this is doing is the firepower is actively um, actively identifying uh, operating system. Once we have our our, our, our right base policy, um, I, w I wanted to talk about the, the the discovery rules that you have in there, the network discovery. And what's happening here is the firepower is using these to passively identify. Uh, or even acti actively identify any host that, that passes through the system. The, the default uh, setup out of the box, as you can see in the little slide there, is for it just to, to identify anything, any interface, any direction, any RFC 1918 uh, private address, um, and then try and generate a profile for that host. The purpose of this links back to the, the concept of the firepower being uh, a next generation firewall and putting traffic and threats into context. The firepower is using uh, what it knows about the operating system in the intrusion prevention process in two ways. It, it know, if it knows the OS, it can gauge whether an intrusion rule triggered is relevant. For example, if it's a Windows exploit attack against a Linux OS, then obviously it's not much use. Um, it will then even try and work out the, uh, the version numbers of the OS and then it can actually get vulnerabilities, like a list of vulnerabilities, um, and then use that to, to gauge whether uh, an attack is actually of any relevance on this, on this target. Now, um, what I would say you should do is change the, the, the standard, the default value in there from, from, any, from any private address to, to match your internal networks because, um, because actually what will happen is this, this feeds into what, uh, what I'll speak about in the next slide, which is the recommended rule settings in, in SNORT. If you, if, you don't have, um, if you don't have the right networks identified in the discovery, the right hosts identified, then SNORT will basically recommend um, it'll recommend rules for, for for objects and hosts that you're not even trying to protect. So I'll talk about that next. So um, I presume a lot of people have seen uh, sort of have a box may have been in and seen the the, the IPS uh, the IPS settings. Uh, you can go in here and um, you can basically get 
the Cisco firepower to, to generate recommendations. And ba based on what I was saying on the, on the previous slide, you can, uh, if, you, if you define your, your hosts and the firepower knows exactly what it is you're defining as protected networks, because that's, that's what's important to store, it's protected networks or external networks, um, then they will, it'll actually generate and run the rules and, and you won't get lots of IPS signatures and, and that are for, for hosts that you don't even have and therefore um, it, it has a, not just a performance improvement on the box but it actually reduces false positives which again was sort of feeding back to what we were saying earlier about getting useful information out of the box. So I think a lot of people are doing this. I, I, I see this around a lot. Every, everyone's sort of really tuned into this sort of idea that you you would use the recommendations. I, just as a note, I would say it works. I, I even schedule it. I, I don't have a problem with it. I trust it. Um, so I would be definitely doing that. If, you, if you're not scheduling it, but you're doing it as a manual process, um, I would say it works and I would do it. Um, okay, so let's say we've, we've got our we've got our policy. Uh, we've got our uh, intrusion policy, but um, and we sorry we and we've we've got our we've got our sort of discovered host and we've 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 applied that to uh, we've we've applied the recommendations, but we probably do actually want more than one intrusion policy. You can you can add the networks um, into the middle there if you see, if you see the little section in the middle there, and then you can generate an intrusion policy that's that's based on. Um, on the network specifically what you what you want to examine and then the benefit of this is is that you say if you've got a firepower with m multiple segments on it uh, DMZ and internal multiple internals uh, multiple layers of protection then you can create a fire firewall policy that that more mirrors the hosts that your uh, an intrusion process more mirrors the host that you're expecting to see in that segment so um, what you can do, go in, add, add the networks into that network section, then generate the recommendations for that, save that as a particular policy, so maybe save it as inbound intrusion to DMZ, let's say, and then go into your, your standard access policy and, uh, and apply your very specific intrusion policy to that flow, that flow of traffic. So again, as I mentioned, this is helping with reducing false positives, it's about making uh, more efficient use of the box, but it's it's about it's about making it do exactly what you want. It's about it's about um, security through 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 a lack of complexity, a lack of a lack of noise in the in the events. So, um, going sort of talking about reducing noise and and reducing events, which is sort of a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a theme, I would say. Um, a couple of easy ways to do it, and certainly the easiest way to do it. Um, what you can do to sort of reduce that noise uh, is, let's say you've got a, a, a rule that triggers all the time, it might be something like a network scanner or, or a, a poorly coded piece of software, or something like that. Um, you can find the offending rule, uh, so you've, you've got sort of your intrusion events there, and you can go in and find the rule that you want, this particular source, this particular destination, and it's triggering this particular rule. In, in, in the example here, a, a detection of a of a network scan. Um, in your in your intrusion events, uh, you can then go into there, drill down into there, and you can find the actual uh, find the actual signature that, that that relates to that particular rule, and then you can take that and, and go into your intrusion policies. So once you've once you've gone into there, you can then open up the intrusion policy and set the action as a pass. And what this is essentially doing is saying yes, this is triggering for the same signature, but I'm not going to alert on it, I'm just going to let the traffic go. Um, and then what you would do is take your, your source and your destination and then um, save that as a, as a new edited intrusion policy, as a rule I should say. And then you can utilize that and that will be saved in the, in the local rules and the local rules get utilized before the the downloaded rules, the rules from the Talos or the rules from from other sources. So what you're what you're doing here is essentially making uh, a new edited rule that reflects the exact traffic that you're generating an alert for. Then we take that rule, our edited rule, we we go back into into our um, into our actual IM intrusion policy, and then we can 
we can edit, find the rule that we've made, our, our, uh, our local rule, edit it, and tell it to generate events by, you can see there, just clicking a little down arrow and can see generate events. Uh, one thing I think is a little confusing that um, I've been asked about in the past, which is you, you need to set it to generate events to get it to trigger. Because actually, if you just set it to disabled, understandably, it won't trigger. And, and, the, and the other option is to generate and drops. But, but what, what you, but by setting it to generate events does is, is triggers the rule, but it's set to a pass, so it allows the traffic through. So by doing that simple process, and I, I'm very happy to, um, to send anyone the details of that if they, if they like, by doing that simple process, you can start to manually remove uh, um, these false positives that you'll be receiving in your network because everyone's going to be getting them of course you are um, and you'll probably have some you know if you if you manage your own fire powers yourself you will probably have a, a number of these that you have maybe found really irritating and, and, and this is a, a really great way to, to, to mitigate those for you to get rid of them I should say um, okay so um, correlation and just this is this is a, a real a real real win for me I think this is this is something um, I don't see a lot of people using but it's an incredible feature and I think actually I think people will use more and more as time goes on because uh, as I'll, t I'll talk about a little bit later there's this sort of this idea of uh, of the ecosystem um, there's this idea of what do you, you you might have the, the before and during covered but what are we going to do with the after um, so it, it's a tremendous feature. It's, it's, it's a bit of a differentiator. I don't see a lot of other vendors doing it, if anybody. Um, it built, actually built into the management device. Um, you can obviously buy other sort of you know, bolt-on products like a, a 40 analyzer, so on and so forth, to make these sort of deep CM style de decisions. Um, so there, there are many uses for correlation, but the main idea is, is to tie several events together in order to make a decision on whether something in our network is either a threat or, or not. And then what we can do is either alert on that or, or we can we can act on that. So when we alert, we can alert on so many factors. I mean, they, they, I, if, you, if you've owned one of these and you've had, you've had a little look, um, the, the lists are, 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 are quite long. So we can alert on, on baseline traffic profiles, um, uh, host profile, whitelists, which I'll talk about again later, and then we can use e uh, either a built-in response, uh, something like um, um, like alert groups or, or NMAP, all the way through to you know, uh, custom-written APIs that you can get from third parties to, to interact with their products. Um, and there's, there's also uh, Cisco's sort of common API, which is the, the PX grid, which is um, the platform exchange grid. And that's how you can interact with other Cisco products like, like Cisco ICE, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So I flipped onto that, there we go. Um, this is just a little bit of an idea to show you sort of the, the, the thought process, the, the, the order of operation again, but for correlation. Um, this is how rules sort of are, are or run through in the system, and and you can you can nest these. So this is really just to give a bit of an idea. It, it's it's just a bit of an overview. So so firstly, the firepower looks for an event trigger, and this could be a new host, a new connection, a new intrusion, abnormal traffic, a massive list of, of of options there. And then we look for our values associated with it: how many bytes, which hosts, whitelist violation, connection from a certain geolocation. Again, on and on and on. Um, then we filter this to certain users, networks, or hosts, or we can even trigger a connection tracker to, to deeper monitor uh, the, the traffic between you know, the, the traffic that we've identified. Um, and then at the very end, we can have some sort of response, which at its sort of most basic would be an alert or, or a group of alerts, uh, and all the way through to things like uh, an API or, or PX grid action. Um, we can also even change the, the attributes on a host so that it, it fits, uh, sorry, that, so that we can actually report on that in, um, uh, in our eventing and, and in actually uh, in our granular reports that we can create. Okay, so, hey, we're motoring here, aren't we? Uh, okay, so that's uh, a little bit about the IPS tuning and eventing. I think there's more. If, if you want to get in touch with me, please, please do. Absolutely happy for that. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the extra features. Uh, it touches again, a little, sort of a little bit of uh, mixture between the two, but it touches on some of the things we mentioned previously. So some of the extra threat detection features, like the network analysis and whiteness profiles, a little bit how they work and and whether you know 
I, the fact that I think you should be using them basically to be honest. Uh, so um, network analysis, uh, it, it looks a bit impenetrable but there's some things I think you should be looking at here. Uh, it's an important consideration I think. Uh, and, um, the purpose of it is to, is to get the firepower to be able to, to see threats. I mean, that, that, this is at its, at its fundamental core, what it's trying to do. It, it's, it's to try and get the firepower to see uh, traffic that has uh, sophisticated evasion techniques that are being used, maybe, and to put, put uh, packets back together in a format that, the, uh, that can be inspected by SNORT. So we're talking about TCP stream reassembly, protocol normalization, protocol enforcement, whether it decompresses HTTP, Quite a lot, quite a lot of things. Um, most firewalls are going to do TCP reassembly and normalization, but you can do some extra things with the firepower that I don't, that I haven't seen anywhere else. It's, it's granular control, it's traffic normalization for individual networks and for for individual operating systems. Um, the purpose is that you can actually, a little bit like the the intrusion policy, you can be more strict where it counts or be less strict and less less processor intensive, less laboured on the box where it's not so important. So the sort of the counter counter thoughts on it. Um, so a little bit confusing, but it is very different. It's, it uses the same sort of terminology for a base policy as you may have seen with the with the intrusion policy. So it's the connectivity over security and all that sort of stuff. Um, the the options here are setting the the intensiveness and the um, and the, and the strictness of the normalization and inspection. Um, I, 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 it's interesting from a from a techie perspective to, to run through all the different options, but I think that really you can use the base policies to to get to get a basic use, and then you just tweak a little bit on top of it. So what you'd always expect, we're going to have balanced balanced security over connectivity, so set your base policy, and then you would go in and then you can actually look at the different settings and then put your put your networks in and then put your actual your host types, more commonly your servers in these sections really, uh, into the into the various sections in the in the network analysis policy. And what this is actually doing is is getting the firepower to treat these hosts differently. Uh, to, to actually within the same policy to have a different approach. Uh, so, for example, uh, um, Linux may w be willing to reassemble a more fragmented packet than Windows. Don't know if that's true or not, but um, so we may need to make Firepower uh, know about that and behave accordingly. And if we put the the network in there, or a single host is also possible. You can then define. You can you see the little drop down box there. You can pick Linux or whatever uh, Windows. And then Firepower will adjust. I'll adjust the the IP defragmentation, pardon me, defragmentation accordingly. Um, so we then have a policy. In this case, our our augmented policy, our, our adjusted policy. We can then save that and place that uh, as our base policy. And then for certain certain areas where we're we're trying to uh, Control more strictly, or uh, such as maybe inbound access to uh, to our web web server or something like that into a DMZ. Then we can we can we can set a more strict policy, and then set these as exceptions within our our access control policies. And there's a setting under the advanced settings where you can set that you can see there the to run from, and then set a separate network access policy. So the the balance connectivity uh, and security. If you have a look down the list and you know and you know a little bit about how this stuff behaves, you, you you would see that there is actually quite a few things that you would want to turn on on there. So for some really critical servers, I do think this is this is something you want to be trying to use because because there's a lot of there's a lot of TCP TCP streams that you you might not be reassembling as an example. Um, okay, so another feature we. I, I, mentioned it earlier, but this is a bit more of an in-depth look at, which um, it's something really powerful, should should be using, um, is the host whitelist profiles. So it's a little bit easier sort of to digest and to explain than the than a network analysis policy. As I mentioned earlier, Firepower is always trying to discover hosts passively or actively, and the information goes into a host profile, which is viewable under uh, hosts and their network map. 
all the hosts in the system carry various attributes and you can even add custom attributes if desired and you can set the app, set the application uh, clients and ports for both sending and receiving and, and the and the client type not just not just the port uh, application type I should say so you could then say that a web server in your DMZ, my continuous example, is is listening on on web and RDP, and it should be sending out traffic with nothing else other than Windows updates, specifically Windows updates, not just port 80 to port 443, but Windows updates um, using the the Open App ID. Once you've set these whitelist attributes, you can then incorporate this this whitelist for your web server into your correlation policy. And then the firepower is going to monitor if, if anything that, go, it, that goes through it is, is a violation of that whitelist. Uh, so let's say somebody, uh, an, an admin even, connects to your web server and, and uh, installs an SFTP server or, and then, or connects out to the, the internet that isn't Windows, yeah, Windows updates, I should say. Uh, well, that, the whitelist violation will trigger, and then in the correlation, that can, that can then generate uh, a response again it could be an alert or it could be something more invasive like uh, like a px grid and, and and a quarantine which I'll mention a little bit about later uh, it's really powerful it's it's totally underused I don't see it in deployments I, I think there's because it feeds into correlation which is which is maybe a complicated concept and again everyone's got day jobs haven't they um, I think people are sort of you could see it, think it's a great idea, but but they haven't really got round to utilising it yet. I, I would thoroughly recommend uh, spending some time looking at it. And obviously, you you, you don't have to um, you don't have to interrupt production traffic. You you could be just generating alerts quietly. You, uh, you, know, you can you can make the responses that you want just to make sure you're getting these things off the ground and working properly, even if you've already got an existing deployment. Um, so. Yeah, so just some little slides there, just showing you the various uh, uh, clients and applications that you'll have visibility of. Some um, some extra little bits I mentioned them in the in the in the features of the Firepower. This sort of open standards and and this ability to to extract feeds from various shared sources, online sources, cloud sources. Uh, you're already using the, the security intelligence feeds from Cisco. Uh, that that would be part of part of the box. Uh, so this is your IP blacklist that you can get, but but I think people know a little bit, but maybe not using them. I would have a look at IP feeds you can get from other sources. A couple of examples there of lists that you might look at, um, and these are the blacklists that you're putting into the into the rule bases. Something that I, I, I don't see people using, but it's definitely worth having a look at. Um, really interesting is the threat intelligence director, which is a little bit like. Uh, the security intelligence feeds, but whereas the security intelligence feeds are purely a blacklist driven, you know, an IP blacklist, a URL blacklist, a, a DNS blacklist, the security intelligence feeds are more of a, a sort of um, a, a complex um, marriage of lots of different factors in, into one uh, response. So you might have the, the, the hashing of a file in tandem with uh, a, a certain uh, uh, URL, we, we sort of all brought together as one, and you can take these feeds. Hail a taxi or a taxi is is a really common one. You can take these feeds and utilize them in a, a sort of a separate res response uh, policy, which is underneath the, the threat intelligence director. Uh, you can set these to monitor, so you can again you can you can get this stuff going in a production environment without actually impeding your your network traffic, your, your production traffic, I should say. Um, so I, I would I would be definitely interested. Uh, in having a look at it if I if I own the box, okay, hey, okay, cool. So uh, appreciate the time. We've not got too much more. I know there's two, <laughs> two, two more sections there, but um, they're, they're reasonably short. So um, next we're going to talk about best practices. Um, it's just a, just a few for you here. Uh, let's have a look. So I mentioned it earlier, but just going to talk a little bit more in depth about it, just just to make sure, really sort of reinforce the point, just make sure I, I think you should be using this if you're not using it already. Um, the pre-filter policy is is layers two to four of the OSI. It's looking at it's looking at basic aspects of the traffic. As as we saw before, if you allow something through to the access control rules and block it at the access control rules, uh, but you're only doing that. Purely on on source and destination IP, or, or you know that you know, two to f OSI model two to four 
uh, Ethernet, uh, sorry, network ports, TCP, that sort of thing. That sort of thing. Um, then you're you're allowing uh, the traffic to go through lots of other policies that you actually might not be utilizing, so or or you don't want to utilize. Uh, there's some very good examples. It's, it's not so much just choice, but but you might be running uh, backups through the firewall from the DMZ. You might be having CCTV software through there or VoIP software, um, or VoIP traffic, I should say. So when you when you go all the way through to your access rules, you've got the you've got the network analysis inspections. You've got, you've got all sorts of other things going on in there that aren't even that aren't even just intrusion policies or, or uh, access policies. Um, so in the pre-filter policy, you can actually set uh, traffic to be fast path straight through the system and essentially just sends it straight to the egress. So I would be definitely do, utilizing this uh, not just for reducing the performance impact of the box because you know, the boxes, some of the big boxes, are quite capable of dealing with access policies. Um, but but there, there could be latency or there could be uh, issues with uh, the inspection of certain protocols. So GRE is a, is a perfect example. If, if you inspect GRE, you can cause all sorts of issues with the traffic going through the box. So I'd be 100% definitely looking at pre-filters if you're not using them. Have a look down your rule base, see what stuff you're, you're not actually really getting involved in inspecting, or maybe you've got you've got problems with traffic and you've been trying desperately to, to, uh, to get it through the box without it falling over. I would have a look at, at pre-filter policies there. Two um, reasonably uh, new features, I would say: um, automatic application bypass and intelligent application bypass. Um, talk firstly, obviously, about uh, automatic. Essentially, what we're saying here: it, it sounds like it sounds like uh, um, maybe it's a bit of a misnomer. It sounds like what it's doing is just allowing traffic to go through the box without being without being inspected, but it's not so much what it's doing there. It's, it's, it's actually, if one of the many snort processes that run on multiple cores in the box, if one of the many snort processes fails or is degraded, uh, maybe it's, it's trying to inspect a, a file that's too large or there's, there's obviously a multitude of reasons, then what the automatic application bypass does is just restarts that single you know, that single process. It doesn't restart everything. It doesn't stop stop all traffic. It doesn't bypass uh, store for all traffic. Um, it's um, it's under the, the device management. It's a tick box. You don't have to. There's not too much to set on it. If it's not already on, I would turn it on. Um, I think you'll find that uh, if you say you've got problems, that you, you people uh, tech will probably ask you to turn it on anyway. Um, the next option is the intelligent application bypass which although it sounds like it's almost the same thing is actually quite different so what we're doing with the intelligent application bypass is we're defining um, we're defining thresholds and performance thresholds for our snort and then um, relaying that relating that I should say to certain types of applications so we select the applications our performance parameters that latency CPU uh, latency of CPU, I should say, latency or CPU, I should say. Um, and then once the firepower has identified the application, because it needs to be able to identify that first, uh, and these thresholds are met, then it fast paths that application through the device. You can sort of think of uh, intelligent application bypass as a, as, an, as a dynamic way that the box can send traffic to the pre-filter. If you're, if you're crazy enough to, to have read a million data sheets by Cisco, you'll know that actually the, 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 the firepower devices, the 8000 series the legacy devices were actually just capable of doing this anyway, they just did it automatically on the, on the firepowers the, uh, it's, more of a, it's, it's more of a setting that you work on the, the settings that you have to put in are a little bit sort of opaque it's, it's hard to work out what you need to put in there so if you, if you do want to use this, uh, just just drop me a mail and I can send you some some default parameters and, and answer any questions that you've got on there too. Um, I think the last one for my uh, best practices is variable sets. Again, it's a little bit like the, the network discovery. There's some defaults here that we should be trying to avoid. Uh, the the home net that you will get in there, the, the default value for home net is just set to any and external net is set to any. How how snort works is it sees things as, as protected traffic or external traffic. So if you have protected traffic as in your, your home net as any and external traffic as any, um, 
not only are you going to be in inspecting more than you need to be inspecting, um, but you're also going to be getting a lot of false positives, uh, and, and that, again, feeds into this noise, and, and, you're, and you're not using the system efficiently or getting the information you want out of it. So, uh, for most deployments, you would set your whole net to the internal networks that you have. Um, if you want to send me some information about your deployment, um, I can tell you a little bit more because if, if you have a complicated deployment, you might well want to set them slightly differently. There's a couple of different sort of factors that you have to take into account. But I would say for most deployments, including a, um, including a, a firewall with an internal and a DMZ, you would set your external net to any and your, and your home net to the actual internal networks that you have. Um, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, last one actually for the best best practices. It's, it is quite important as well, actually. Uh, so you find this in a bit of an odd spot. It's 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 how the firepower deals with file inspection, but it's actually underneath the the access control policy. So again, uh, more more impact for lower end in, uh, or lower end appliances. But what settings you have here impacts the network performance. Um, as well, so you might you might find that you get a lot of latency, latency, um, not just not just actual sort of high CPU usage. Uh, even if you have a, a really fast appliance, if if your if your WAN link is not so fast, you should be looking at looking at these settings because because actually what we're doing here is we're setting the maximum file size that that the that the firepower is willing to send up to to Cisco Cloud for inspection and and things like that. So. Uh, it's, it, there is no, there's no values that you should set. You know, you, you don't have a, a, a 500 meg connection and then set them to this. It, it definitely is is a marriage of the performance of the box, the utilization of the network, um, and and the speed of your WAN link. But what I would say is, if you if you've got problems with latency and and, and certain issues um, around, around traffic and, and certainly around policies where there's file inspection, I would be having a look in here. Um, like I can say it's in the advanced settings. Okay, right. Okay, so so the the last little section, I wanted to talk very briefly about uh, the the other vendors and the other devices that you can get to to link into Firepower, because uh, sort of as I, as I touched on earlier, Firepower uh, in these sort of the new sort of uh, ways that we describe things, it's 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 the before, during, and after these sort of marketing tools. But but the before and during Firepower is, is supposed to be covering. It's your intelligence in advance and it's your inspection when you're actually downloading or or, or, or sending traffic through it. Um, there's also this sort of this concept of after. Uh, so what Firepower does is is Cisco will bang on about their their, their uh, easy, you know, open APIs and all that sort of stuff, but they, they actually have a built-in uh, ability to talk to other devices that work on the platform exchange grid, the PX grid. Um, there, there is a list of technical alliance partners. You can see the little list down there at the bottom. Um, and then the list that list will, will tell you what, what platforms can interact with different things, as in um, this interacts with platform exchange grid, for example. And what you can use, if we if we think back to the correlation policies, uh, we can take these complex nested scenarios and actually interact with with other devices in our network. Um, namely things like network access control um, which I'll talk about in a second um, or actually like blocking on other devices and that sort of thing so uh, what I've got here is just a little example of how PX grid might work for what they call rapid threat containment uh, utilizing Cisco ice across the, the, the threat grid but but actually you can other products can can achieve this as well so uh, a user downloads uh, a malicious file um, the, the firepower sees sees that and uh, and then blocks the file and then sends the contextual information to ICE or or to another vendor. ICE takes this information. It then changes the policy for the endpoint. Obviously, ICE being a network access uh, control uh, software, it it changes the network access policy for that endpoint. And then we can either set that endpoint to either be completely quarantined or have limited access. So let's say we've got um, let's say we've got uh, a user that's in a PCI segment, something you know we're trying to very, very firmly control. It's going through the, it's going through the box. It doesn't have to be the internet. It's going through the box to somewhere else. Firepower detects a file. It, it can tell ICE about it. ICE could say, right, well, you know, until you've, until you've actually done a, a quarantine or remediation, you can only just get out to the internet uh, for, you know, for maybe for a virus scan or something, something along those lines. 
uh, see this. I, I, this is definitely going to be massive. I, I, um, um, I, I really think that we're going to be doing this. So um, I'd definitely keep this on your radar, I would say. Um, one of the other things that, that uh, is a good cross-platform, um, if, you, if you're using it especially, but if, you're, if you are thinking of refreshing what you have in your endpoints, this is, this is, and, you, and you have firepower, this is, this is quite interesting. Uh, you can link into the advanced malware protection endpoint software on all your devices and then feed that information back into your FMC and then use, again, go back to using correlation. You can take factors like uh, indications of compromise that you can see there on the right hand side and then use those in either alerting or response. Again, you could go back to things like the PX grid and stuff like that. So you can you can take information that you've gathered from one place and the, and the, I don't know whether anybody's seen the file trajectory thing, but it's quite cool to look at. Um, and you can take that information and then utilize that with actually um, actually actually on, on some other sort of device. Okay, so uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll be happy to hear, but uh, has anyone got any questions? No? Okay. Uh, wow, was it, was it that concise? That's amazing. So uh, there's, there's obviously a number of other things that we didn't talk about. Uh, apologies if I didn't talk about them. Uh, so well, you'd be here all day, wouldn't we, of course? So. Have a, have a look at the list. If there's anything on there you want to talk about, um, even licensing, even though please try not to talk to me about licensing, um, my email is here. Uh, please go ahead and drop me an email, and I would love to hear from you, and I would love to give you a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. <laughs>